In the late afternoon of May 28, 1914, just two years after the sinking of the ill-fated Titanic, Canadian Pacific's luxury liner, Empress of Ireland, prepared to depart Quebec City. For her master, this was a dream come true. 39-year-old Captain Henry George Kendall, a veteran of the high seas, was for the first time in sole command of one of the most marvelous ships afloat. As the Empress slipped her moorings at 4.27 in the afternoon, her passengers had no way of knowing that Captain Kendall would soon be steering them towards tragedy. The Empress of Ireland's transatlantic crossing to Liverpool, England, was scheduled to take just six days, the first two of which were to be spent on the closed waters of the St. Lawrence River. In reality, the journey would last less than 10 hours, and when it was over, the Empress of Ireland would rest on the bottom of the St. Lawrence, and more than 1,000 of Captain Kendall's passengers and crew would be dead. The mists of time have only served to deepen the mystery surrounding the sinking of the Empress of Ireland. How could one of the safest ships afloat have sunk in just 14 minutes, killing more passengers than the Titanic? How could death on such a grand scale barely rate a footnote in history? And who, in the end, or what, was ultimately responsible for such a disaster? After repeatedly reviewing the official record, filmmaker Dave Greener is convinced the truth of what happened out on the St. Lawrence in the early morning hours more than 90 years ago has yet to be revealed. Knowing that vital clues may yet lie trapped within the sunken wreck of the Empress of Ireland, Dave has turned to extreme divers Terry German and Kim Martin. For it may be that only with their help can Dave hope to turn back a page of history and solve once and for all the mystery of who or what was responsible for the Empress of Ireland's nightmare voyage. The Empress of Ireland's journey down the St. Lawrence began without a hint of the horror to come. As Quebec City receded in the distance, passengers settled easily into life on board, oblivious to the danger ahead. Among those making their way to their cabins and berths below decks were 170 Salvation Army men, women, and children. Well, we were going over to the Salvation Army Congress, which they hold every so many years, and we had looked forward to this for quite some time, and it was quite a, an event for us. Grace Hannigan was just six years old when she rushed to explore one of the world's greatest luxury liners. I did a little bit of looking around that night. My, my father's boss's son took me on a little tour. He was a couple of years older than me, maybe more than that. And uh, we, we went around and looked at the boat. Well, of course, to, to me, it was, uh, it was just beautiful. It was like a lovely hotel, you know? And uh, everything was just uh, almost out of this world. <laughs> And I was quite thrilled with it. Not so foolish as to claim to be unsinkable like the Titanic, after eight years of safely transporting tens of thousands of passengers on transatlantic crossings, the Empress of Ireland could claim to be one of the safest ships afloat. Still, at 2 a.m., with most passengers asleep and much of her crew retiring for the night, the Empress of Ireland would be helpless to protect those in her care. I was awakened by a, a noise that sounded like a, a firecracker just going past the porthole. <clears throat> and I guess the three of us were awakened. And my father thought that it was the pilot coming for the mail, so we didn't bother about it at all, but just a few minutes later, somebody came to our door, knocked on the door and told us to get out, that the boat was sinking. And so we just went, just as we were, and we, could, we were quite close to the stairs, but we could hardly climb because they were, the boat was listing so fast. 
As young Grace Hannigan and her parents struggled up the listing stairs, 60,000 gallons of water a second were gushing into the Empress from below her waterline. Those below Grace in the lower third-class berths never stood a chance. Whole families were wiped out by the flooding waters. The Titanic had taken almost three hours to sink. The Empress would go down in just 14 minutes. Anyone who did not escape from below deck within the first five minutes was doomed. As desperate passengers swarmed out onto the boat deck, things went from bad to worse. The increasing list made it impossible to launch the portside lifeboats. With a sudden jerk, the Empress of Ireland pitched over onto her side, tossing Captain Kendall and others into the frigid waters of the St. Lawrence. Rescued by a passing lifeboat, Captain Kendall was forced to watch helplessly as his dying ship lay completely on her side, with as many as several hundred desperate souls clinging to her steel hull. Then, at about nine minutes after 2 a.m., the Empress started to slip below the surface. We sat on the high part of the railing until the boat went down, and then we were thrown into the water. And as far as I know, the three of us were together for a few minutes. <clears throat> then I found myself hanging onto a piece of wreckage. News of a disaster on the St. Lawrence hit the world's newsstands later the same morning. Shock and panic followed. According to first reports, the Empress of Ireland and the Norwegian collier Storstad had collided in fog near the tiny hamlet of pointe au pere Quebec. Families and friends, desperate for news of loved ones, mobbed Canadian Pacific offices in Montreal and Liverpool. Look at the concern, yeah. the terror on these people's faces. Is, yeah. or, did my loved one make it or not? Yeah. You know, you never stop to consider that it was just more than a thousand people's lives that were affected. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, you know, generations wiped out. Yeah, and that, in that day and age, if the breadwinner went down with that ship, that family was destitute. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. It's over. Or for a child like Grace Hannigan. Right? My father's body was found later on the shore. He was able to swim a little, and he, I don't know whether he made it to shore. But he had a little heart condition, so he probably would be played out before he got there. And I saw him in his coffin, and I knew then that he, he was gone. But my mother, you see, I never saw, so I still thought that she, was, she would come, and I still look for her, even on the streets. On the bottom of the St. Lawrence, the Empress of Ireland's stately dining rooms, elegant music rooms, grand staircases, and charming cafes were now transformed into a macabre mausoleum. 1,012 of her passengers and crew were dead. Of the 138 children on board, only three boys and one girl, Grace Hannigan, had survived. Less than three weeks after the Empress's sinking, a public inquiry was held in Quebec City. In the courtroom, officers from the two ships accused each other of causing the fatal collision. One Canadian newspaper observed that if the evidence was to be believed, the Empress and the Storstad had collided violently while lying motionless two miles apart. One or both of the ship's officers had to be very, very mistaken or lying. But which? Bringing the truth to the surface after more than 90 years will prove to be a much bigger and more dangerous challenge than Dave Greener could ever have imagined. Early June 1914, the Empress of Ireland lay at the bottom of the St. Lawrence River. The recovered dead had been buried. It was time for the accusations to begin. It was clear who most people blamed, but it had to be made official. 
Mentally and physically spent, the Empress of Ireland's Captain Kendall nevertheless stood to give his testimony as the Commission of Inquiry's first witness. Echoing the prevailing Canadian sentiment, the ship's master placed blame for the tragedy directly on the Norwegian collier Storstad. Captain Kendall testified that after dropping the river pilot at Point Au Pair at 1.30 in the morning, the Empress of Ireland steamed off on a northeast heading. It was then he spotted the Storstad approaching from six nautical miles away. The Empress is at, uh, drops off her pilot at Point Au Pair and then heads north 47 degrees for about 18 minutes. And at this time, the Storstad is also coming down west-southwest. So I'm coming down along the shore, Terry. Right. You're steaming towards me. Yeah. She'll now... In the first of several unexplained actions, Captain Kendall then testified that he had ordered the Empress brought around to a more easterly course. In what would seem to be a dangerous move, Kendall was steering the Empress closer to land and closer to the Storstad. And, uh, yeah, Kim, you want to come in just a little further? Now they're... Uh... Every seagoing ship displays mast and navigation lights, green on the starboard or right side, red on the port or left side. Kendall testified that he ordered the Empress to pass the Storstad starboard to starboard or green light to green light. Unfortunately, Captain Kendall hadn't counted on what was to come next. Then around, I'd say about 25 minutes or so in, fog rolls in. Now, the fog has rolled in and has obscured the Storstad from the vision of the Empress. A minute after the disappearance of the Storstad, fog engulfed the Empress. So in the fog, he orders his vessel full speed astern, thus, as the testimony says, stopping the Empress right here. You're stopped? Yeah, okay, great. Captain Kendall swore he brought the Empress to a stop, and she sat motionless in the water for another six to eight minutes, more than enough time for the Storstad to safely pass. Suddenly, at 1.55 a.m., Captain Kendall testified the Storstad shot out of the fog on his starboard side. The Storstad was on a collision course with the Empress. According to Kendall, the Storstad had committed the unforgivable sin of altering course in a fog. First Officer Alfred Severin Jensen Toftonus had been in command of the Storstad prior to its collision with the Empress. Struggling to make himself understood in English, the Storstad's first officer gave the inquiry a very different story from that of Captain Kendall. Toftonus insisted that yes, he had seen the Empress's green starboard light, but, and it's a big but, he then said he saw the Empress change course. At first showing both green and red lights, then just her red or port light. So now what she's doing and she's coming down this way. Contrary to Captain Kendall's course, testimony, Toftonus insisted that the Empress had changed from a starboard to starboard passing to a port to port passing. So now the Storstead believes that they're going to be crossing port to port, and fog envelops here. Storstead, realizing has lost sight of the Empress, decides to take some way off the ship. Losing sight of the Empress in the fog, Toftonus claimed to be moving the Storstad ahead slow when suddenly the Empress came fast out of the fog on his port side and cut across the Storstad's bow. According to the Storstad's first officer, it was Captain Kendall and not he that had done the unforgivable and changed course in a fog. Faced with two irreconcilable stories, on the 11th of July 1914, the Commission of Inquiry chose one ruling that it was the Storstad that was responsible for the disaster. Yeah, he's the, he's the head guy. Dave yeah. Greener can't help but believe that the inquiry was wrong to side with Captain Kendall. But Dave's opinion is about to set him on a collision course with Kim and Terry, whose knowledge of the Empress has come from more than a decade of exploring her sunken hull. Why would he alter his course? I mean, he's going north 47, northeast 47. Why would he alter it to north, northeast 73? I mean, right now he's... he's He's putting himself in almost in the path of the store side. He's bringing him in closer, and it's, it's going closer to shore. How far does he need to go out in the river? I don't know. You know, at some point he's got to turn. He can't keep going north 47 forever. He's got to turn at some point. So whether it's there or another five minutes, I don't... This, personally, makes more sense to me. The Empress is coming out this way, then she's altering her course, 
And then at doing such, then, then before the fog, Storstad is saying that she saw, like, port to port, she saw a red, uh, red crossing. So, which makes total sense because in the day, that's also the rule of the road. But a radical course like this, it just seems unbelievable that a ship well, like that would do that kind of course. Well, fair enough. I mean, keep in mind, this is probably like, this, I'm over-exaggerating a bit yeah. here, you know but what it's I mean? Still, I'm trying to emphasize the fact. It's still three course changes. This is the captain of a passenger liner. Captains of passenger liners go down with this ship. They wouldn't do anything like this and endanger 1,200 people. Never. We'd never believe that. We won't accept I don't accept it. Confronted with Kim and Terry's opposing view of Captain Kendall, Dave has little choice but to seek outside help. And where better than the birthplace of the Empress herself? Here, the Empress of Ireland was built and launched to great expectation in 1906. In the century since then, Glasgow's shipbuilding industry has declined into a shadow of its former self. But the city remains a center for 21st century marine study and innovation. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. <laughs> Good conversations on the phone. So yes, uh, Colin. 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 Nice Colin. to see you. Finally yeah. meet you. It's a pleasure. Yeah. You go along. Hold on. Pleasure to meet you. Marine engineer Bob McNair, professor of subsea engineering Colin McFarlane, and University of Glasgow's director of maritime studies Olaf Olsen are often called upon to determine the causes of disasters at sea. However, this will be the first time this elite team will be asked to make a determination about a disaster 90 years old and one that hits so close to home. If you look at, I don't know if you guys have seen these yet or not, but if you, if you look at the, the bow of, of the store stand, I mean, you know, there's... There's some, there's some good damage here. Dave presents the Glasgow team with archival photos taken after the Storstad was seized by government officials. The photos detailing the damage done to the bow of the Storstad have raised questions in Dave's mind about a crucial piece of Captain Kendall's testimony. Before it it's solid. Hit, it's it been down, down here. here and just before twisted this right could hit, yeah. the anchor, the big anchor bolts pushed this. What down. would cause that? For damage to be on both sides, port and starboard, mm -hmm. would that not mean that the Empress would have had some way on? Was she moving? Well, the Empress was moving. I almost mm -hmm. certainly she was moving. Captain Candle had testified that after reversing engines, the Empress was stopped dead in the water when the Storstad suddenly came out of the fog on a collision course. Kendall insisted the Storstad had rammed the Empress so hard, its own momentum twisted the Norwegian ship around, slicing open the fatal gash in the Empress's starboard side. Well, I just thought we could do something simple that would show how Kendall's testimony doesn't quite work. Well, sounds good. Okay, Bob, you give me a hand. I'll get the booth, actually. Get this one, this one first. Okay. 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 Right, hope she doesn't sink. I'll go first. Okay. What are we doing here? This is the... This is the Empress stop and the star stud coming in to hit her at quite a steep angle. Okay, so here's star stud coming. Star stud doesn't rotate. Right, right. And it's Empress pushing the Empress disappears away into the distance. If Empress is stopped, and there's no way that Storstead can just mm -hmm. hit her and then rotate and bounce away into the distance. It's so she had, matter. basically she had to have way on. So this is Empress moving and okay. Storstead moving. Go for it, Bob. And here we come. And Storstead rotates. There's no way that Kendall's idea holds up in a real world. Mm -hmm. Nothing like that could happen. Whereas when Empress is moving, the force of the Empress hitting on there twists the star stud around. And you get a situation that is observed by people in the star stud and people in the Empress. Believing this to be just the tip of the iceberg, Dave now has proof that a crucial piece of Captain Kendall's testimony was wrong. More than ever, Dave is convinced Kendall was intentionally shifting blame to the star stat to cover up his own role in the disaster. To prove this, however, 
Dave is going to need evidence from deep within the wreck of the Empress herself. How you doing? Nice, nice to meet you. Yeah. Nice and finding you. We spoke face to the name. This is Terry Dillon. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure. Yeah. How are you? Not a bad idea. Yeah. I'd like to see that. Let me get this out of the way. While remaining at odds with their friend, filmmaker Dave Greener, divers Kim Martin and Terry German have nevertheless agreed to conduct an underwater search of the Empress of Ireland's unexplored engine room. Dave is hopeful such a search may yield evidence supporting his increasing suspicions of Captain Kendall. It just does not up. When you go through the inquiry, which I've been through a dozen times, you know, it's Kendall's, his testimony is not right. According to the rules, the moment his ship entered fog, the captain of the Empress of Ireland should have ordered his well-trained crew to man all watertight doors, ready to close them. On the witness stand, however, Captain Kendall admitted to the judges that it was only after the Empress and the Storstead had collided and his ship was sinking that he ordered the watertight doors closed. But was Captain Kendall covering up for having never given the order at all? Given in time, the order to close the Empress of Ireland's 24 watertight doors would have divided the liner into 11 sealed compartments, any two of which could have flooded without fear of sinking. With most of the watertight doors remaining open, however, flooding waters were free to rush through the entire ship. Dave Greener has already proved beyond a doubt that Captain Kendall was wrong about the Empress being stopped in the water prior to the collision. If Dave can also prove the Empress's captain never gave the closed watertight doors order, he will have called into question Captain Kendall's entire testimony. Testimony which shifted blame for the deaths of more than 1,000 men, women, and children from Captain Kendall himself to the Storstad. It really is very dangerous for that ship. The evidence Dave will need, however, lies somewhere deep within the Empress's immense engine room. Getting that evidence means Dave will have to send Kim and Terry and their support team to where no divers have ever gone before. If you look closely at it, uh, here, you'll see the size of a man. Whereabouts would you? In relation to where this gentleman is with the engineer, where would you find the telegraphs? Any it's idea? Or? Very difficult because it's really quite dangerous because this ship's over at 65 degrees. So there's a lot at stake. There's a lot at stake for me as, as a filmmaker. There's a lot at stake for this production, and there's a hell of a lot at stake when it comes down to people's lives. Uh, I hope they can do the job, but really to push them into places where it's, it's too dangerous is a bit scary for me. What's, what's obviously most difficult about this is being asked to go where nobody's been inside the ship before. We've had uh, debris slides inside the wreck. Again, you got to realize everything's on a 65 degree slope. The Empress of Ireland sank in just 170 feet of water. In 1914, her mainmast and funnels were still visible just below the surface. 
Ninety years later, this multi-beam echo sounder image reveals the toll the relentless currents of the St. Lawrence have taken. The Empress now lies buried in the muddy bottom at a disorienting 65 degree angle. Choked with silt and debris, the interior of the Empress of Ireland has disintegrated into a deadly maze. Kim, Terry, and their support team will dive with rebreathers rather than traditional scuba tanks. Rebreathers will recirculate each diver's air throughout the dive, preventing the release of air bubbles that could bring debris within the wreck raining down upon them. That's the only light detector. Yeah, their equipment will also enable Kim and Terry to actually talk underwater. For even the most experienced divers, the Empress of Ireland comes as a shock. After having descended through the fierce currents and frigid temperatures of the St. Lawrence, divers discover the Empress herself is barely visible through its changing mantle of river silt. Having made their descent by scooters, Kim and Terry and their support team swim along the upper rail to orient themselves. then down the port side to search for a small, elusive salvage hole. The only way into the unexplored stern of the Empress. <laughs> Once inside the Empress, Kim and Terry must negotiate their way through a maze of collapsed catwalks and tunnel through spaces so narrow, there may be no opportunity to turn around for great distances. Any obstruction ahead could prove fatal. Inside, Kim secures a navigation line. Should the team lose visibility, this line will lead them back out. The search then begins for a route into the Empress of Ireland's unexplored engine room. It's there the divers hope to discover evidence of Captain Kendall's last orders. Orders from the captain of the Empress were relayed from the bridge to the engine room by use of mechanical telegraphs. Orders manually entered on the bridge telegraphs were instantly transmitted to identical port and starboard telegraphs in the engine room via a series of cables and chains. The ship's engineer would confirm he was acting on the captain's order by manually lining up a second arm on either telegraph to match the captain's order. This return call was instantly relayed back to the corresponding bridge telegraph via another series of cables and chains. Captain Kendall testified that after having ordered closed watertight doors, his final order was full speed ahead in an attempt to beach the Empress. But it was too late. River water pouring into the engine room had already killed the Empress's steam power. Since the ship's engineer could not comply with Captain Kendall's last order, he would not have sent a return call of full speed ahead. The last return call to be found on the engine room telegraphs should then be close watertight doors, if Captain Kendall's testimony were true. The Empress of Ireland's bridge telegraphs were rescued by divers in the 1960s. The engine room's port and starboard telegraphs, however, still remained buried near the base of her immense engines. To 
their astonishment, Kim and Terry realize that despite the obstacles, they have actually made it into the engine room. <laughs> Using engine parts as their guides, the divers try to orient themselves. <laughs> It's pretty horrendous in there. It's this actually, looks brutal. I think it's, it's, it, it, it looks a lot better than it did. Yeah, the valve seemed to be more at like 90 degrees, so I don't know if. That whole bulkhead is... Yeah, like it's even you know, shifted down. It seemed to be more than 65 degrees to me. Like, well, the support bracket might have gone for the manifold and yeah, it's going to slip down. It's sort of slip down. And the, the pipe tunnel, there might have been a collapse there. Okay, Kim, Kim will explain it all. Let me know yeah, we're near the stuff. back bulkhead here, Bob, and you're going to see the two... Even though they risk parts of the Empress's massive engines collapsing on top of them, Kim and Terry are confident they will be able to locate the engine room telegraphs on their next dive. <laughs> I'm just going to hitch a ride with you, eh, Kim? Yeah. Despite taking extreme care as they maneuver beneath collapsed catwalks and shifting debris, clouds of silt are making it harder and harder for Kim and Terry to find their way back into the engine room. Then, deep within the wreck, Kim hits a dead end, and suddenly everything starts to go wrong. Are you okay up there? Turn around. Are you okay? No, it's not a turn around. Turn around? Yeah. Okay. Come on, Johnny. That's okay. Oh, that's just gonna take a little work. In the confusion and the almost zero visibility, the team is separated, and Terry is caught up in the navigation line. Get real action on here. Pull the head of the line to you. Take up the ah. Yelling through their mouthpieces, Kim and Terry try to locate one another. Where are you? Is that you? Yeah. Okay. I sit right here, right duck, in the line. In the struggle to free Terry, the navigation line is destroyed. Hold on, hold on. Okay, Their only way out now is using one of the distant film lights as a beacon. With the divers safely out of the wreck, the team as a whole must now decide whether to risk another attempt on the engine room. By next day, the decision has been made. Hey? 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 
Yeah. Once again, problems seem to be mounting for the divers when... Did you see that? What are you looking at? Oh, shit! It's a telegraph! <laughs> Incredible, like letters are all there, just standing out bright. I just couldn't believe the condition of it. So you guys actually found them? You found both of them or you found just the other uh, one? You can see the other one. It's buried down in the mud. It's really low under a broken bunch of catwalks and debris. Starboard one's a hole there. Couldn't believe how white the face was and all the lettering still on it. The glass is broken out, but here, Jim. I can see the chains coming up and the woods falling down that used to encase the chains in. All that stuff is there. It's just amazing. This is all catwalk here. We're dropping down below. Oh, what's that? Is that That's it? it? Yeah. yeah. Is it? There, there it is. Yeah. Look at the condition. Look at the condition. That's Chad. 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 unbelievable. You can almost even see. This is this is a return call. What is that? Standby. Standby. What would it be, Bob? That'd be stop. Really? So it's all stopped? Yep. Well, <laughs> no way. This does not match what's in the in the inquiry. The closed watertight door order, which was the That's second the last order, is not there. Despite his sworn testimony to the contrary, the all-stop return call on the engine room telegraph proves Captain Kendall never sent the order to close watertight doors as he claimed. With all of his testimony now in doubt, is it possible Kendall was solely responsible for the Empress of Ireland's fatal collision with the Storstad? Back in Glasgow, Bob, Colin, and Olaf will spend weeks testing every bit of new information against testimony from the official inquiry. Their knowledge of ship's design and engineering. Their study of nautical charts. And their analysis of prevailing weather conditions and river currents at the time. Finally, their work is over, and the call to Dave is made. We then come across the point that roughly here, the Empress had sighted the ship coming in on what was the Empress's starboard bow. After months of poring over official testimony, after several expeditions up the St. Lawrence River, after risking the lives of close friends and of never being certain of what lay ahead, it has come down to this. Dave Greener must simply stand and listen, just as the officers of the Empress and the Storstad once stood in court to hear their fate. The Empress has made an alteration of course to starboard. Suddenly both red and green side lights are visible from the Storstad. What Dave hears comes as both a shock and a surprise. And that's what then the Storstad uh, missed. Mm -hmm. Well, I traveled, what is it, 6,000 miles for an answer, and I got one. It uh, wasn't what I expected. Um, I just want to take this home. I want to take this home, and I want to share this. I mean, most importantly is that the word gets out. Dave hadn't expected both ship's officers to be telling the truth about what happened. How could both Captain Kendall and First Officer Toftinus have told different stories, and yet both have told the truth? As in life, Timing is everything. Captain Kendall insisted he brought the Empress around to a starboard to starboard passing. Unorthodox, but safe enough if both ships had stayed on course. On the Storstad, First Officer Tofton has claimed to have seen the Empress move to a port to port passing. Two irreconcilable positions? 
not quite. Under orders from Captain Kendall, the helmsman steering a ship the size of the Empress from one course to another would have first steered the ship well past her new heading. That's where timing comes in. From the bridge of the Starstad, Toftana, seeing the Empress making her turn, had every reason to believe she was changing to a port-to-port -port passing, standard procedure for approaching ships. What Toftanus couldn't see because the fog intervened at just that precise moment was the Empress easing back after several minutes to the course Captain Kendall had intended all along, close to the Storstad and on her starboard side. Dead slow in the fog and fearing he might be drifting too close to shore and into the path of the Empress, Toftanus ordered the Storstad to pick up speed and turn to starboard in an effort to avoid trouble. Instead, Toftanus was steering the Storstad toward the very collision he had hoped to avoid. Clearly, the Storstad was not to blame for the collision. The fog was the real culprit. But why had Captain Kendall steered the Empress closer to the Storstad in the first place? Ignored at the inquiry, the reason is deadly simple. The Empress of Ireland had a schedule to keep which meant steering the straightest possible line between Quebec and Liverpool. This made for fuel efficiency and the fastest time. Captain Kendall was simply making a routine course change when he ignored the risks and steered the Empress closer to the Storstad. His intention was to get his passengers to Liverpool on time, as advertised. That simple change of direction would ensure that 1,012 men, women and children would never reach their destination. Although Captain Kendall was not solely responsible for what happened that night, his failure to act before and after the fatal collision condemned 1,000 men, women and children to a horrific end. Throughout the inquiry, the Empress's captain took no responsibility for any of the deaths under his command, placing the blame instead solely on the Norwegian collier Storstad. Yet it was the forward motion of the Empress during the collision that opened the fatal gash below her waterline. And it was Captain Kendall and no other who ignored regulations and failed to order her watertight doors manned, then closed. The Empress went down in just 14 minutes. Every moment the watertight doors were closed, would have meant lives saved. In his autobiography, Captain Kendall barely mentioned the Empress of Ireland, skipping over it as a memory too painful to mention. But the truth has a way of catching up to each of us sooner or later. Nurses attending him on his deathbed said that in his delirium, Captain Kendall seemed to be reliving the horror of a shipwreck. <laughs>